Back on May 1st, my friends and I were lucky enough to interview a skilled FX artist. He's lent his talents to Shazam, Maleficent Mistress of Evil, Sonic the Hedgehog, Godzilla vs. Kong, Fast and Furious 9, What If, and now the upcoming Moonfall. He started as a single FX artist at MPC and then went on to become an FX technical director at DNEG, Squeeze Studios, and now Framestore. In his free time, he sharpens not only his FX skills, but also the rest of the VFX pipeline to craft his own personal creations. I would highly recommend checking out his art station, Vimeo, YouTube, and Instagram. It will be well worth your time. So, we were graciously given this awesome opportunity, and what do I do? I be pooping incompetent and inefficient, thus taking me 238 days to finish this video. Thus, I would like to deeply apologize to both my friends and our interviewee. I am so very sorry for taking this long. Anyways, without further ado, here's the interview. <laughs> What exactly got you into the field of VFX? Uh, what exactly? Um, I would say uh, maybe back in the high school, I started to do research on the uh, Jurassic Park. So that's actually how I got in. At first, I didn't know about the production line to create a film. So, but uh, I was lucky. I found the entire production documentary on YouTube. So in the documentary, they actually starting to break down like uh, there's an early production, mid production, and like, final production. And I was just checking and see like which part I like, and then I end up just loving the whole thing but uh, i found that the effects part of the effects the visual effects uh they were growing so i starting to look into this uh, i found that the visual effects has more range of what what you can do because uh, there is a difference between the uh, special effects and the effects special effects is more like you do real thing like you blow up stuff for real for the visual effects is like more for the safety reason that they have to do a like, cg so like computer generate so yeah i choose visual effects because they were growing and then you have much more freedom you can do magic stuff explosion and such how did you uh, come to work for mpc i actually um uh, get in touch with them back in college when we were presenting our work in the graduation year and then they kind of visit us because every year we have a huge presentation to the industry so if you go to Sheridan college they normally do that yearly they invite a whole bunch of the company to check your work and then they also do some company visits during the school years and then i came across their work and i saw that they worked on that's at 2014 uh, so so they actually contacted me uh, at the end of my school year, said that, hey, uh, if I want to join them. They have a, a different department, it's called Academy. So it means that you join them, like, almost like a beginner, like a learner. They don't really mind your skill level. You join in and they starting to teach you how the whole production work. And then after three months or two months, uh, they place you into uh, one of the production. Yeah, so that's basically how I begin to in MPC. Do you uh, happen to remember anything that you worked on in school that like impressed them or drew their attention? Back in the school, while we visiting all the company, I was lucky enough to visit one of the studio in Toronto, uh, Canada. It's called Pixel Mando, and they work on Fast and Furious and Game of Thrones stuff like that. The HR team they present to us what they are looking for. So there are different departments. There will be creature or roto team or uh, effects or comp and lighting. And then I decided to go into the effects team because that's how the explosion created and all the crazy stuff. So uh, I asked. What do you look like when in terms of you're looking for an FX artist? And then they often say that they are mostly aiming for something small, like just cheaply small, such a small thing. In order to make it look real, you have to put actually tons of work. What they are looking for is they are looking to compare your stuff with the real life footage. So what we normally do is uh, when we are doing the effects, no matter big or small, they will compare. It's better to have a comparison like the real footage to see if you actually match the real footage so as long as uh, you almost match it or you're almost perfect they will actually uh, be impressed and then contact you what drew you into like fx environmental smoke explosion like what drew you into that instead of like modeling or texturing or other stuff that's a very good 
question. So in a school year, normally people will try so hard to do everything. But uh, when you are truly in this industry, especially for the big budget film, you will have to narrow down to only one single department. For example, when you're doing effects, you won't be able to do future effects and stuff like that. So what got me into the effects is like in the college, we get to learn the entire pipeline. So from the beginning, like modeling, texturing, reading, so on to the final, final comp. And then one actually make me want to jump into effects is the variety. For example, if you are doing a creature modeling, you will always almost doing the same thing like over and over. And even for campaigns over and over, but it depends on what you For me, those are things that just repeat way too much and I just don't like to stick in one place for too long. For example, for the effects, uh, today if I ask you to create a fire effects, you can have a thousand ways to do single uh, fire effects so there's like different way you would never be stopping in just one solution there are tons and tons of solutions so you get to experiment you get to like uh, digging more and you will find more achievement when you uh, find a better way to do it and even more efficient way to do it i would say the range of experimenting in terms of effects that's how i caught my eyes and how i jump into the effects so yeah effects is pretty much cover the environmental magic and all that stuff sometimes we even cover the character effects do you need any like basic knowledge of computing and figuring out how to get the simulation right based in mathematics? Yes, actually, um, I know that most people thought that we just create stuff by clicking on the shop tool, but we actually, we rarely do that uh, when we're working. We have to do stuff from the scratch. Let me use an example from Godzilla versus Kong, that when we do even one single degree on Godzilla, we have to uh, improvise it, because the way they fall is, uh, it might seem like a short distance, but it's super long distance. So we have to figure out a way to fix the stacking we actually have to calculate the speed so like really simple stuff such as velocity and stuff like that to generate in between frame for the smoke to catch up the step so yeah i would say you don't really need like intense mathematics skill but for sure uh with the great mathematics skill or a programming background will definitely help you a lot especially uh, the programming because of the programming you can actually dive much more deeper into each node to even like increase the efficiency of the coding inside of the node like you can actually jump in and change the coding to make them surpass or skip some unnecessary parts to make the whole thing go way faster and then, yeah i would say it definitely helps but it's not necessary so calculating the speed of the kaiju do you have any like uh, canonical top speed for godzilla or kong pretty much like what's the fastest they went I would say uh, when Kong trying to like jump off their building or even punch Godzilla, it's almost reached the speed of sound. So that's way, way too fast. And while I was working on Godzilla vs. Kong, I also was in the other production. It's called Sonic. You know how fast the Sonic run. And then the Kong situation, sometimes when you jump off the building, you need to drag the smoke trails. We have to actually almost do the same thing as the Sonic. We have to drag a procedural uh, trail for it to actually follow in the future otherwise nothing can follow with such speed but it's all because of the look that the director wants so i would say speed of stop is it harder to work on something that's going super fast or something that's slow I would say uh, they are not that hard. Actually, the only hard part would be, I would say, the slow mo. So when you're doing a slow mo, you actually need more frames. So each second is like 24 frames. So imagine if you have to make a one second clip into like 60 seconds. Uh, while your effects slow down, you have to create some like fake effects. We tweak around to make the effects go super extremely slow, or we actually calculate the in between frame and then stretch it much, much longer. For the run. So I would say that doing a slow-mo would be a huge challenge because of the machine power you need in order to do such. But I would say speed is not that crazy to deal with. Instead, I would say some magical stuff would be much harder than uh, regular environmental stuff. With magical stuff, do you get to like play around with the physics and just go crazy? Okay, I would use 100% as my example because uh, 
for the Maleficent, we have to deal with the, the magic anchor, the fiery looking magic. So we have to tweak around with the particle floating around Maleficent, but I'm not the one that's building the setup. Luckily, we have a really talented uh, artist that build the main setup, but uh, I get to uh, manipulate around when she's transforming into the Phoenix uh, at the very end shots. Basically, the part I get to uh, manipulate the physics is the they were asking to create a ball of the floating magic that's going around the Phoenix while it's transforming. Uh, what I did was I used a sphere and then I create a velocity field to go circular and then I give bunch of noise and make them flow around. But while they are blowing around, uh, like these two like, stick together so they don't spread out. So yeah, there are lots of tweaking in that shot. How do you balance it with like personal life and mm -hmm. stress and stuff? That's a more question that everyone asks, I believe. So uh, in the industry, sometimes we have time we call crunch time. When during that crunch time, we will do a tons of overtime. But normally, you will have a leader in the team. They are in charge of giving you shots. But normally, they will give you the shots that you are confident with. So I would say I didn't really spend that much time because I was kind of already confident with it. But there are times when I'm facing really heavy crunch time, I would say back in the Shizan production because uh, there were lots of changing and then we had to take the schedule so in order to balance it I would say after the crunch time try to apply for holidays or vacation to balance your life a little bit so you don't overheat yourself so yeah I would say take a break after the crunch Across Sonic, Shazam, Maleficent, Godzilla, Drift Kong what's your favorite shot that you've ever done and then your least favorite? I wouldn't say least favorite because they all have their own challenge. But uh, for my favorite, I would say it was the shots from the Sonic, from the tornado shots that's inside. The main shape of the tornado that's already done by the DC uh, Vancouver before they officially shut down. So when they pass off the shots, they actually already done the, the small parts for the tornado. But what I get to work on is the part when the sand within the tornado. I actually uh, generate a force that's trying to match what Vancouver did because it was too rushed so we didn't really have a chance to get the setup and stuff so yeah I, I find out we have lots of challenge on that that shot and also there was a ship in, inside the tornado and then the sand hitting the, the ship I love that shot yeah I would say that one is uh, my favorite shot but my least favorite I would say probably the Shizan emblem the, the glowing stuff the lightning inside his chest because uh, someone already done the shot of uh, the setup so all I need to do is open the shot and then just run it through. I would say it's good at the time because I get lots of free time to uh, understand the company icon while doing the easy work. So yeah, it's not like a least this ever is least interesting, but uh, you still gain uh, lots of experience. In VFX breakdowns I see and like reading interviews, I hear a lot about like layers and like layering onto shot to shot, you know, through different parts of the pipeline and stuff. How do you make sure that one layer doesn't get in the way of another? And has there been a time where like you receive something mm -hmm. that's been like layered improperly and like you have to fix it? Mm -hmm. Like what happens? For that part, I would say that is for the lighting artist, but I believe that they, okay, I will speak from my experience. So when we are rendering something, or we have to go back and fix something. What happens to the layer? For example, if we have a dust, there is a grid inside of the dust. When we need to render, we need to have a mask layer. So you will render, but without the thing inside the image, it will get black out like an alpha. So it's like black. So you will see the effects running through. But the most intense way to avoid that is we will have the render so it means that the axr image will include distant information stuff like that so uh, they will come to together so you don't even have to worry about what is layering on top of what but for the comp artists when they are placing the stock footage they will have to be aware of that because uh, you require a little bit of throw toy but as long as you have the d you are actually fine and you can get away with lots of uh, layering stuff what i would say is the most expensive way of avoiding the trouble so the cheaper way would just uh, be careful uh, when you are doing your max because the deep is really uh, slow to render since you store all the information was there any like specific direction you were given by adam wingard when working on gvk or was he more like just do what you do 
for that question, uh, most of the time, the artists like us, we don't have the direct uh, face time with the uh, Adam. Usually, the supervisor will be the one that's doing that. So, for example, uh, uh, for this week, uh, if we've done a sequence of uh, effects, the supervisor will be the one that's putting together all the list you want to show to the director. And the director will ask if either if they want to make a change or stuff like that. But for the artistic choice, usually we will have something that's for a storyboard or the concept art. And then as an artist, we will always go through the storyboard and concept art before we do any effects. So when the storyboard or the concept art show to an artist, we will try our best to uh, match the reference from the concept art. And then uh, sometimes we do a several version, depends on who is your lead. Sometimes the lead they like a uh, several version and then we'll try to do a collection of uh, those versions and then present to the director and the director have the, his choice to pick whichever one he decided to go with. And sometimes it's not just one shot. It's like, okay, I like this version, but can you improve this or that? Something like that, yeah. What were your favorite shots to work on during GVK? In GVK, I had a chance to work on the shots when Kong uh, jumped on the building and uh, Godzilla actually slide the building off the head and then Kong has to hold the building. And unfortunately, they removed uh, tons of tons of layers. In, in that shot, I actually did two huge tornadoes on top of the building uh, while the building is falling down to fake the suction when the yeah. dust on the building that's falling down down by the building itself, but maybe uh, they decided not to go with that. I think because they tried not to hide Kong himself, but yeah, that's really unfortunate. <laughs> Somewhat building off of that with uh, not hiding Kong, I know there was some criticisms of Godzilla King of the Monsters, where there were too much particles and dust covering the kaiju. Or... Did you guys take that criticism like into account during this movie, or is this just, oh, guess we just feel like doing this now? I would say they didn't tell us, but you can already feel that while you're working on the film. So for, for example, for there is one shot before Kong pulling out the axe and then he pumping on his chest. Uh, originally, I had a chance to get a setup. So whenever Kong's hand that's touching the chest, it created a huge shockwave of the dusty shockwave from his chest. And originally, those dust were really, really heavy and it almost covered up Kong entirely. And then reduced it a lot and lot. And then I remember they told me to try not to hide the character. But uh, for this criticism, I would say it applies to any sort of film. Uh, in MPC, from what I remember, uh, even like from the previous film I worked on, we always try not to hide the character, especially the face. So I would say for the KLTM, yeah, they've done a little bit too over, I would say. Sometimes the director will look at uh, YouTube critique or even supervisor, sometimes they redo uh, what people want. But yeah, people have their power to actually over control some of the film, we take the criticism. Was there any sort of responsibility when working on Godzilla vs Kong? Like, was there any pressure? Because most people like think of these two icons as like super big deals. So I would say most of the pressure would be the early production when they are deciding to either keeping the look of Godzilla or the Kong. So I would say all the pressure is probably not from an NPC. I would say it's either Weta or Skin when they took in around the character. But uh, in terms of overall pressure, I would say we always try to make the overall VFX uh, to be improved in the last film and to be clear. And to make it overall look good. So I would say the, the pressure will mostly come from that and the pressure of the two characters is not mainly from NPC. What was the red in Kong's axe uh, specifically? We were trying to bring in a lot of colours that felt like they were in an opal. And so when Kong finds the scepter, it's almost opalized. And then of course the blade is made of a Godzilla fin. But the handle was almost like a piece of opal. So the red, when I joined Godzilla vs. Kong, concept is already locked down. And then um, one of our tasks is to go through uh, the sequence shots and go through the concept. And then I still don't know the purpose, but I see the, the really clear render of the X that's almost look like crystal and you can see all the shiny inside of the bone, but we still don't know the deal with it. So I would say that's a good question for the artist that's working on the X. Was there anything particularly challenging with GVK that's something that you enjoyed doing? 
like I said before, the most challenging part would always be the speed. But for me in particular, I don't really have that much challenging shots. But I would say so far, the shot I see that has lots of challenge. I would say whenever Godzilla and Kong fight in the Hong Kong, you can see that sometimes they hit the building. But the problem is that there are some restrictions of certain type of building we cannot destroy. So my supervisors and uh, some key artists, they actually have to come up with a way uh, whenever Kong or Godzilla touch the building uh, they need to admit breeds and smoke but they cannot be destroyed so I was a really good job to them they actually came up with a really good like, assistance in order to load in the entire uh, Hong Kong city and you can actually pick whichever part you want to destroy and automatically the smokes and some uh, full step trails but yeah I would say coming up with that setup would be the most challenge in the show or what I know but uh, in scan line the water shot is just incredible. Was there any Godzilla movie that you took inspiration from when working on GBK? Oh, while I was working on the movie, I often try to compare both the 2014 or the uh, KLTM and sometimes even the uh, Kong movie. In some of those shots, they actually have a really great example of like a, sometimes in, in the old, old movie, you can still see a really good physics or a really good effects. So we always try to look back and then uh, pick a few stuff to recreate. But uh, of course, we don't have to set up anymore. So we always have to recreate almost the same thing. So yeah, those three movies, uh, sometimes we go back and take a look, especially when Kong Kong in the chest. I took a look at the shots from Kong when the same Jackson like really mad and pumping the chest so that shot I took a happy inspiration from. Is there any other movies or TV shows that you're gonna be working on soon? Some are uh, confidential, but I would say I just finished the Marvel show that will be on Disney Plus, and I will be joining in the future uh, next week of the work on that. But there will possibly be another uh, Marvel show, so yeah, my guess is some Disney stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When you were talking about how like they took out uh, effects that you did, how often mm -hmm. does that happen? Like how often do you go in and do something and they're like, no, pull it back and then they take mm -hmm. the work away? I would say very often. And the best example I would say is the KOTM. Uh, in one of the shots when Godzilla come out of the ocean and he turned away from the submarine, they actually uh, missing uh, tons of layers of water. <laughs> so yeah, they do it really often. This is uh, this question just you know it's shot in the dark. But do you happen to know what happened to any of the uh, Godzilla 2014 assets? Like, does has MPC said anything? So I would say they still have it. They still have the model. If, if they really like uh, look into it, I believe they still have it. Uh, for example, when I just joined MPC, uh, one of the tasks uh, before we finish our academy, there is certain tasks you have passed. And we actually use a uh, Muto uh, from 2014 when he destroyed the dark scenes. We use that to test our skill. So yeah, I, I believe they still have some of the tasks, but probably not more. Thank you very much. I appreciate you taking out your time. It means a lot. Beautiful work. I honestly can't wait to see what you do next. Yeah, thank you guys. Because uh, like I say, I'm just a really small part in the big production. So thank you for trusting me. From what it sounds, your job's underrated. Yeah. It brings the scenes to life. It is really impressive, so even if you are one of many who work on this, like, you still contribute. And then as a whole, you all manage to, as Braden says, bring these scenes to life. Yeah, thank you, because I'm one of the many, but there are lots of artists. Um gonna be honest i don't i don't know where to go from here so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah um so i guess that's it yeah, yeah that's that's it. It. thank right. you for thank you so time. much yeah thank you guys keep, keep doing what you're doing i guess i'll just end the call or something yeah, yeah. all right thank you bye-bye